All right, my friends, we're continuing the Ananda Way of Life, Guidelines of Conduct for Members of the Ananda Sevaka Order. We are in Article 6, Marriage, and we'll finish it today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Baba Ji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to all. Dear Swamiji, help us to understand the guidance of the Masters as it comes through us. Help us to live up to your example of dedicated discipleship that we might trust God, trust Master, trust God to work through our brothers and sisters, that we might live in constant faith and happiness in your company. Om Peace. Amen. I was reflecting on some of the things I said in yesterday's broadcast about the sort of what's really being asked here in terms of marriage and all that it implies about involving ourselves in community life. I was commenting about how this is a monastic order and in any traditional monastic order the a necessity to make your personal life conform um, to the overall harmony of the spiritual community you live in. It's just the given. But what we're trying to do, what have, we have been trying to do at Ananda in our residential communities and from that expanding out to set an example for the world is a new kind of monastic life where the primary emphasis is on the devotee and God, but that capacity to be in tune is profoundly enhanced when people of like mind join together. That's what Ananda is. It's people of like mind joining together to help each other attain the the shared goal, which is to be ever deeper in tune with God especially in the transitional age we're living in between Kali and Dwapara Yuga, where the values that are represented by Ananda are held by almost no one. I mean, if you compare it to the number of billions of people there on the planet and the number who are really dedicated to following this line of gurus, it's it's not noticeable. And the thought form, all the other thought forms of worldliness, of self-interest, of I'm going to do it my way, of don't you tell me what to do and I want what I want and just on and on it goes, are so powerful and so persuasive that it's very challenging to live in a spiritually deep way unless you have some support from somewhere. Because of the internet, which was a Dwap- is a Dwapara Yuga invention and direction, we are now able to make community across uh, space and across time to a certain extent. So that even if someone is physically very isolated, they can have direct, real-time, immediate contact with like-minded souls, which is, of course, an extraordinary boon spiritually. So the Ananda way of life, as I've been describing it, can spread out quite far. But when I was actually reading through, as I was commenting yesterday, that this seemingly most personal of all decisions needs also to be a community decision. Now, I'm aware of my cultural isolation when I say this, because most, many cultures certainly have a long-standing tradition that marriage is a family matter. It's, a, it's a, an alliance between two families 
and such an important decision could not possibly be left up to a couple of young people who really hardly know their own minds. So <clears throat> my reaction to the intrusion, the assertion of community authority over this very personal matter <clears throat> is, a, is a very American reaction. So I just have to sort of say that I recognize that. But of course, that's the bias I come from. And Ananda um, has its origins in the USA. And Master himself came all the way from India to establish self-realization first in the USA. So there's something happening here where it all has to come together. But I was very interested in my own reaction reading these paragraphs that um, as I've been 50 years in community and I've loved every minute of it. But I, I was surprised by how, um, how I, I felt an inner resistance to this. It's completely irrelevant to me personally. It just doesn't mean, I mean, this is not a position I'm ever going to be in again as long as I'm Asha in this body. So it wasn't personal. It was just almost like the cosmic resistance to it. So I had to ask myself um, overnight, why is it okay? And I don't mean why is it okay for the community to ask that of people, because I, that part I do understand. I, I've seen too many mistakes, unfortunate decisions made that might have been averted if there had been more openness to a broader um, input. But why is it okay to bind ourselves to the community in that way? And I just came up with the simple word, trust. When I first started with Ananda, I moved to the community on June 1st, 1971. I had my 50th anniversary just a few weeks ago. Ananda was one community in one location, and Swami Kriyananda was in residence. So what I trusted was him. I just didn't even really think about anything else because I, that was, it was just a, a straight alliance. Of course, he lived 45 years more, you know, so most of my spiritual life, I've had that personal connection with him. But that's not what, what most people have, and that's not what any of us have now. In 1987, after 16 years of living in that isolated rural community, country living, which I swore I would never give up, but ha ha, there you are, don't make promises you can't keep, um, uh, Swamiji moved me to Palo Alto, and here's where I've been for 30 plus years. And the, the assignment that Swami gave us was replicate as much of Ananda as you can. Just see what you can do. There was no uh, limitation and there was no mm, demand. It was just, you'll be there, see what you can do. So over time, we started a community, which we've now been living in. We don't own it. We lease the property from um, investors who bought it for the purpose of leasing it to us. Um, that lack of ownership has proved to be, in recent years, a bit of a, more of a more of a conundrum than we thought it might be, but that's a separate issue. We've lived in this community since 1989. It's an apartment complex, which is a great, great um, physical model for a community because we're, we all have privacy, but we still live uh, uh, close together. It's, it's been an absolutely wonderful experience. And we've also built it, uh, acquired a temple, and a lot of things have happened in these decades. As we move step by step, Ananda did have a few urban centers at the time in, in, in 1989 when we started, but no one had yet actually created another community. We had one that lasted for seven years, but <laughs> questions over the ownership of that property caused the dissolution of that community after seven years. So no, no urban, and that was a rural community also, so no urban community had ever been established, no um, 
church on the scale that we ended up developing it had yet been established. Now there are many. Um, there are more, not many. Um, and it was very interesting to me to watch how it was going to develop. And from first-hand experience, what I realized, because Swamiji, he visited here often. He, he was always part of our lives. But he did not play the role in this community or any other community that he played at Ananda Village. But it developed in exactly the same way. The church, the temple, the teaching center, the community, it, it, it developed the same vibration, the same um, relationships, the same feeling, um, the same, and this is the word that I finally came to, magnetic honesty is the word that I, I came to, that there was a magnetism present that just kept it in line. And we were working with an entirely different population, a wholly different context than the way Ananda Village had developed. But the magnetism, the spiritual magnetism, the uh, spiritual potential, and, uh, and uh, the, the truthfulness of it um, has been just the same. It doesn't mean there aren't hiccups. There are always hiccups. Sometimes there's giant hiccups. You know, these things happen. But there's a, a power, which I can only call God and Gurus. There's a, a powerful thread that runs through it that, that makes it always work out. No matter how twisted and confused it can get for a time, it has always worked out. So when I start thinking about, oh my, you know, a young person coming into Ananda, unmarried but hopes to be, meet somebody, and then... If you're a if you've become a sevaka, here you are. You have to put that decision. Uh, you have to cooperate with your community for your own personal life. Now, Swamiji has was very has been very emphatic in the, in the vows, which will come later in this conversation. We never pledge obedience. We pledge cooperative obedience. Now. In the traditional monastic order, the Catholic especially, the, well, the Catholic, because that's the model. Obedience is this tremendous virtue. You're supposed to put aside your own mind, your own thinking, your own logic, your own sense of what is right. You're just supposed to obey, and the most obedient is considered to be the best one. Well, Master said, it's not always such a good idea to submit your will to someone unless they're God-realized. And you could have many sincere monastic um, representatives and superiors. That's a very funny word, but superior in the authority who aren't God-realized. And to f be forced to give up your own discernment and discrimination just because someone else has a higher position than you, Master says is very unwholesome spiritually. At the same time, on the path of self-realization, where um, our development is directional and, and progressive, there will absolutely be people within your community who have more experience and more wisdom than, than I do, than you do. And it's foolish not to listen. It's foolish to take the... I will do it my way to the point where somebody's right in front of you who could really help you. And then on principle, you fold your arms and don't listen. So it goes both ways. So this is where Swami came up with this word, cooperative obedience. And what that primarily means is those who have responsibility for the various aspects of the community um, have to cooperate with your point of view. And you have to cooperate with them, um, but they are cooperating with you. So we're, we're mutually working together to try to understand what's best. And, and no one holds, you know, an absolute authority. And Swamiji, again, set the model for this. He, he was always interested in what people had to say. And, and I have several stories in my book, Swami Kriyananda, as we've known him, 
of people who were brand new to the community were just, you know, brought in in a very casual way into meetings or into Swami's company. And he, he never said, well, you just got here yesterday, you don't know. He would say, what do you think? And would genuinely listen because everyone has the same potential to be in tune. Not everybody fulfills that potential, but everybody has that potential and has that inevitable destiny. And everybody is right sometimes, you know, and everybody is wrong sometimes. So we cooperate with each other. So when one takes the Savika vow, which is involving you, it's involving you with people you may not even have met yet. You move to a different community, you, somebody new comes in, somebody's transferred in from another place. Um, many things can happen over many, many years. What is it that we're really trusting? And that's what the whole issue is about taking a vow. What am I, what am I trusting? And, and how, do I, how does my intuition play in my willingness to trust that? No, and, and what we have to primarily trust is we have to trust ourselves. And this is uh, the, the stories of Jesus at the end of his life when he was telling his disciples to eat my body and drink my blood. And the Bible says, they said to one another, this is a hard teaching. And many left him at that point. Master said, it wasn't Jesus who was being trust, t- tested. It was the disciples' trust in their own intuition. They had experienced the divine nature of Jesus as their teacher. So now he's doing something that the mind couldn't quite comprehend. Did the fact that the mind couldn't comprehend the specific thing he was saying nullify all the experience they'd had before? Does this one change in Jesus' behavior at that moment Does it mean that everything they ever felt about him wasn't true? But the question is, could they trust their own experience? What was the basis of their trust in Jesus? Was it, well, everybody else seems to trust him, so I will? Or is it, I know in myself who who he is to me. I don't understand what he's saying, but I know who he is to me. So when Jesus asked Peter, Will you also leave me over this deliberately confusing teaching? Peter answered, where could I go? And what that meant was, you are the whole world to me. I know who you are. I know who I am to you. And where could I go? No other option in the world exists for me except dedication to you and to this path. Um, St. John Uh, who wrote the Gospel of John, always referred to himself as the the one whom Jesus loved. It's just an extraordinary self-definition because John knew the perfection of Jesus' love for him and therefore he knew everything. He was loved by God through Jesus. Where could I go? You You are my link to the divine. Now, Ananda is an institution. It's not a a guru. Um, It's one choice out of zillions in the world. And you're not damned to hell if you go somewhere else. So it's it's a free choice. And when you become a member of the Sevaka Order, what are we trusting? My experience has shown me that we're trusting God and Guru. And if we deeply and profoundly trust God and Guru, all of their human instruments will also find a way. Or I should put it differently, God and Guru will find a way to work through whoever you have to relate to. As long as we keep our trust in that way. So it's not this community director or this person who's responsible, that person is a window for divine inspiration to come, not an infallible window, 
but definitely a wise window. Um, and we have to trust God behind what we're doing. And I mean, I, I remember different points in my life, I just had to say that to myself. It's not that I actually trust this person, but I trust that God will speak to me through everyone around me, and especially those who are sincerely dedicated to the spiritual path as I am. And that is a big level of trust. Yeah. But it's, it's, we, we come to, we, ha, we don't take a vow, we don't become a disciple, we don't choose a spiritual path because it's all comfortable and safe. You know, there's a sort of like, sometimes people when they start talking, they often pick up from popular culture phrases that they then bring in and just use. Like we continue unthinkingly with habits that we have because of prior momentum. There was a point where the words, you know, we have to create a safe place. We have to be safe. We have to feel safe. And yes, of course, you have to feel safe from egregious abuse. There's no question about that. But we're not looking for safe places in a, in a bigger sense. We're looking for places that will challenge us to grow. And if we give our lives to a spiritual path, you know, it, it starts, we give our lives to God, we find our guru-given path, we may find kindred spirits who follow that path, which bring us into a community which has a life of its own. I mean, you see how many steps there are. But it all, the foundation of it is we trust God and we trust Guru. And we trust that even if people treat us in ways that we might not have chosen for ourselves, that if our commitment is to God and Guru, then there's, they are challenging us in the way that is the right challenge for us. Now, I'm not going to say what that response should be, because it's very individual. But that's where we get the power. That's where we get the power to make a commitment. That's where we get the power to take a vow. And we don't take a vow that is effortless for us. I don't take a vow. I will not murder. I will not steal. I will not destroy other people's property. I don't have to make a vow like that. I will not take drugs. I will not drink. I will not become an addict living on the street. I don't have to vow those things. But with all due respect and sympathy, there are people in the world who do who have to fight to hold on to things that are so far in the history of my past lives that I don't have to reach for them anymore. But when I take a vow, it's not because I have already achieved it, but it's because it's right at the, at the proper edge of what I need to learn. And community involves really learning to trust each other and, and uh, to, to f the willingness to really make true friendships and stick with them. You know, Swami Kriyananda set us in his life such a, a challenging example because he committed himself to master's organization. He was a monk in that organization. He was three years with master and then 12 years or so beyond that. He was at 14 years total, so 11 years there. And in the end, the people he trusted and loved most in the world <clears throat> kicked him out and remained antagonistic to him for the rest of his life. So we had to watch Swamiji navigate the balance point between his relationship to Master, his relationship to the other disciples of Master, his relationship to the spiritual community that he'd been part of, um, and then finding his way, creating another community of kindred spirits, creating another community, understanding what God wanted of him, keeping his heart open to everyone despite grave misunderstandings. I say that because the trust is not based on, oh, everything's just going to work out just right. 
I have seen the magnetic honesty, the spiritual, spiritual magnetism of Ananda everywhere in the world. I have seen the power of God and Guru and of Swamiji working through countless individuals. But the example of Swami tells us that things can happen. So we commit ourselves with goodwill, but we never compromise our own moral integrity. And if we find ourselves in an insoluble position, we have to try to discern God's will in the middle of it and ask what the issues, what's the most important issue here. In all the years that I've been with Ananda, I've never had to make a decision myself, compelled from the outside. I've never been bound by a decision that I didn't respect and see the logic of. Um, When I was explaining to someone my feelings about being part of Ananda, after so many years at this stage of my life, that that was what I held up. I've never had to compromise any principle. I sometimes have had to adjust my understanding of what principles were at stake because I have not always gotten my own way. And others have not always agreed with what I thought was the best decision. So many decisions have been made that I wouldn't have made. I would have made different decisions but I wasn't asked to make those decisions. So among the things that I trust in the community I've been part of, uh, as my friend Kirtani put it perfectly, it's not only what God wants, but who he wants it from. So I trust that if Divine Mother has given responsibility to certain individuals, then it's their karmic responsibility to learn what they need to learn. And even if they make decisions that I might not make, it's a matter of taste and personality. It's not a matter of principle. I came right to the edge once of a principled decision um, that was about to be made that was going to impact me in a way that I felt was somewhat of a moral dilemma. But just before uh, the decision came down, it was shifted. Just everyone saw it from a new direction and the situation changed. So it's a real thing to become a disciple. It's a real thing to say, I will live according to thy will. And step by step, as I've spoken, to commit more and more deeply in a very specific way, which is what the Savika order is and the Ananda way of life can be, depending how deeply you committed. But what we're committing to is the Divine Mother's power to guide me. To guide me through whatever she might send and in that way to trust. If we just trust other people, we will, I have found within Ananda that everyone does their best and including me. And just the way my friends over many years have tolerated my delusions, it behooves me to tolerate the delusions of others and trust that one way or another, bumbling along together, um, we'll all find our way. And we'll find our way more quickly, quickly, more safely, more joyously if we join hands together to work for God. God bless you.